Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us for another global level webinar. Today, we have the amazing Dr. Kat West from Winthrop University in South Carolina. She's um, going to be doing another installment our, our on, on our instructional continuity series here at PACBAC, specifically about advising students online. She has an extreme amount of experience in this field specifically as a psychology instructor, but also as an academic advisor, really putting the student's experience first. So I am could not be more excited to kind of get out of the way, let her share what she's learned through both teaching and advising students in person and through this transition online as well as she has a great deal of experience in online education before this mandatory transition as well. Um, but before we get started, just to lay out some ground rules, uh, the first one is that if you have any questions or if you're having any technical difficulties, please use the chat on the left-hand side of your screen to connect with other attendees, as well as share any questions that pop up while Dr. Cat West is giving her presentation. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, like if you are unable to hear me right now, please check the private to presenters box to report any of those issues. A member of our team will get back to you right away, help work through it. And you can use the second icon at the top of your screen to ask any questions that pop up during the presentation. The agenda is that we're gonna do a quick little overview on just what is PacBack, what is this thing that brought us all together today? Um, and then I will kick it over to Kat at, to dive into advising students online. And we'll also do an open Q&A. So I really can't stress it enough. Throw in any questions as they come to you. We really wanna make sure that all your curiosities and confusion, anything, are just handled effectively. So before I kick it over to Kat, uh, I wanted to give a brief little overview of what PackBack and our online program is. We uh, are an online AI-powered discussion platform that scales effective discussion to enable curious and motivated learning, regardless of your class size or structure, face-to-face -face or online. And again, this is supported through AI online discussion. Some brief quick stats over here are that instructors typically use PackBack as a 10 to 15% of the course grade, and it's also used as a weekly engagement tool to develop healthy, consistent engagement habits week to week, while also reducing the individual load on the managing faculty member, which Kat can cover as she has taught classes for between you know, 15 students to 250. Um, but research has really shown that students do engage more consistently cite more sources and have more in-depth posts on PackBack compared to um, your typical LMS. Uh, one of our main and most effective tools is our digital TA management system. This is an AI tool that provides instant and consistent feedback to students about really specifically just how to elevate their discussion posts. It's really looking at behaviors and actions that students can take to become effective communicators, debaters, and just overall enhance their presence in the class and their familiarity with the content. So this circle of transition really kind of shows us how this, uh, how this tool works. While the students are writing their posts, the system is actually giving them real-time feedback to let them know where they can keep pushing in their content. Then the AI goes through, it reviews their posts to see if it does violate any guidelines, if it's been plagiarized, if it's egregiously off topic, if there's, God forbid, any profanity or aggressive language, the post will be moderated. The student's going to be coached on what um, on what violated the guidelines in their post, and they'll be prompted to revise and edit their work. And the professor and faculty focused feed forward tool is the element of our system that is devoted to instructor support. It's just a suite of tools that really help our faculty members massively scale the impact of their feedback while also showing students but they do genuinely care about guiding their growth and supporting them. Again, whether you're a class of 10 to 1,000 students, we all care about this individual student performance and their connection in the class. So our AI will actually suggest top posts that your students have created in the week. We'll send them over to you for review to select those that most resonate with you, with your class in that week, in that live moment. And then also, give you the opportunity to add your own thoughts and feedback as to why these posts actually matter. Why should your students care about them? And then from there, that will automatically get sent out weekly in a newsletter to your students, your thoughts attached. So it's not just the system saying, hey, look at these posts. It's actually you being able to say, this is why I want you to look at these posts and engage with them. 
So with that, uh, I wanted to kick it on over to Kathleen West um, to give like a brief introduction to this uh, absolutely amazing educator. She has, a PhD, she has a PhD in neuroscience and is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Winthrop University in South Carolina. She's taught courses in biology, college prep science, math, and psychology, but for the last 10 years, she has been primarily focused on teaching in psychology. She was also the undergraduate coordinator at UNC Charlotte with on average 1,500 students a year. That is not an exaggeration, uh, as well as many other forms of academic advising. But after experiences in college and grad school, she did promise that she would never let another student learn the hard way if she could help it. Um, my experience working with Kat in the last uh, three to almost four years now has been nothing short of phenomenal. And I think the most impactful experience for me has been the constant hyper-focus on the student experience and how we can just make sure that they always come first. So without further ado, that was. Thanks, I appreciate the introduction. Um, I just wanted to briefly give a little bit of information about kind of my story and my philosophy on advising. It really relates to the last point that you guys just heard there about how I made myself a promise that if I ever got to work with students, I wouldn't let them kind of learn the hard way like I did. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about my, my college and graduate school story. So I attended Clemson University as an undergraduate. I started off as an elementary education major and quickly realized after my first semester that that just wasn't quite the right fit for what I wanted to do. And so I switched my major to psychology, again, without consulting with an advisor, I just kind of did it. And then I got into just about my senior year and I was taking a research methods class. I had no clue what I wanted to do with my life other than I love teaching. That's about the only thing I knew. Um, but what that was gonna look like for a job, I had no idea. And a professor said to me, hey, you're really smart and you're good at research, you should go to graduate school. And so I said, great, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. And I put absolutely that much thought into it. Um, what was that, three seconds? <laughs> I put about three seconds worth of thought into what I was gonna do. And so I applied to all these different graduate schools. I ended up getting into the Medical University of South Carolina into their graduate program, which again, would have been a lot easier um, if I had done a lot of things differently at the undergraduate level which would have been a lot easier if I had consulted better with the academic advisor that I had. So I basically made my life kind of insanely hard and insanely difficult for absolutely no reason, only because I didn't get either good advice or I didn't seek any advice as a student. And so I always swore to myself that if I was ever working with students, that I was gonna make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, that they, not only thought about what classes they needed to take and thought about you know what internships they might want to pursue but were thinking constantly long term what do i actually want to do what do i actually want this to be for something in my life as a job as an inspiration and then use their college and or graduate experience to get to that goal rather than just saying oh this is the next step then i'll figure out what i'm going to do with my life Related to that, I'm going to quickly talk to you about my advising philosophy. So I put this together a couple years ago when I was the undergraduate coordinator up at UNC Charlotte. And I really am not exaggerating when I say we had about 1,600 students at any given point in time. Um, we had a, a, almost 1,100 majors. We had about 400 or 500 minors at any given time. And my job was to be in charge of all of the academic advising. Now I had some people helping me, including a full-time academic advisor, but I was responsible for making sure that those students got quality academic advising. And it's very challenging when you have that many students. And so I took a number of different classes and seminars. One of them was through an organization called Nakata, which I'll, I'll mention to you towards the end, but we were encouraged to write up a philosophy. Now mine, sort of came out like a poem, that's just my personality, but I send this to every single student that I advise because I want them to understand what I see as my job and what I see as the point of academic advising. And I won't necessarily read this to you 
uh, word for word here, but I want you to see that these are some of the reasons why I feel like I need to do certain things that I do during advising meetings. Um, the first one that I have there is really important because getting advice is the opposite of weakness. Some students think that they have to ask, even if they have to ask what classes they need to take, that, that they've somehow done something wrong. And I try to get the student to understand, no, in fact, quite the opposite, that it's not your job to have every class on this campus memorized. That's my job. And it's my job to help you pick what's gonna be the best fit for what you wanna do. And that's your job is to pick what you wanna do. So I try to get students to see that asking for help is not a weak trait. In fact, it's the opposite of weakness. I also want students to understand that learning to help yourself is an invaluable skill. I also want students to understand that it is not their job to keep up with policy change on campus, that that's my job, and that I can help them understand it so that they make the best decisions possible. And then I also want students to know that also part of my job as an advisor is to really listen to you and to hear what you're really saying because sometimes what you're really saying doesn't exactly match the words that are coming out of your mouth and so it's one of those things where sometimes what i hear from a student and i can say back to them is it sounds to me like you're saying you want to change majors or it sounds to me like you're saying you don't really like this particular part of what you're doing. And then that can lead to some very productive conversation that will lead them to a better goal later in life. So basically what is important to me is getting the student to understand that academic advising is not just coming into my office and having me put a check in a box that says, yep, you've picked classes for next semester. That academic advising is really how to use what they're doing in school, whatever level that might be, graduate, undergraduate, and otherwise, to get to a goal. And that my job is to help you and to constantly remind you to be thinking towards that goal. So that's kind of where I stand and that's where most of what I do as an academic advisor comes from, is sort of that philosophy. So the biggest thing that I want you to take home today, if nothing else from my presentation, is this. Whatever you're already doing in an online situation when you're working with students, excuse me, whatever you're already doing in a face-to-face -face situation with students, you don't really need to change that a whole lot. Now, I'm going to give you some best practices and some things that I do just in general for academic advising, but I do those things whether I'm talking to a student like this on the computer or whether I'm talking to a student who's sitting next to me in the office. That really, um, the interaction that you have with a student and the questions that you ask and the, the conversation that you try to have should be the same whether you're having that conversation online or in person. So here's another thing that I think it's important that you keep in mind. This is really what students need or want from advising. And it's really funny when I talk to colleagues about this because some colleagues are like, yeah, absolutely, I agree. And then some colleagues almost get their feathers ruffled a little bit, um, particularly with some of these things in here, like number one. So the first thing is students wanna know what classes that they need to take. But more than that, they wanna know why they have to take those classes. And that's the part that ruffles a few feathers sometimes, because sometimes people like to say, well, because you do. And, and that is the answer sometimes. But other times, that can actually lead to a really interesting conversation. We can say, look, yes, you have to take these gen ed courses, or yes, this major requires that you have a minor. But if we look towards your goal, which is what the second thing is, we might be able to use your minor as leverage to get to a better job or to use your minor as leverage to get to a better graduate program or something like this. So I also talk to them about here's why I'm choosing these classes for you or here's why I suggest that you use this class for this purpose, or you take this minor, or you consider this change in your major. Because if you've told me that this is the goal, and that's going to lead me to number two, I always use academic advising sessions as a goal check-in. I want to say, are you still thinking the same thing for what you want to do with your life? Do you still like interacting with people the way you told me you did before? Are you still thinking you want to have that job that you were thinking before? And it's okay if they change. In fact, it's it's helpful sometimes if they've had an experience and they go, yeah, 
I tried that and I don't, I don't think that's anymore. That's great. And I encourage students to talk to me about that. And I say, okay, then let's, let's recheck in with what you do like, let's rethink towards goals. And then we'll make sure those classes that we selected really are going to get you to that goal. And then the third thing that I think is really important is that students want to be able to trust your advice. And a lot of people think, well, they should trust me just because I'm a professor. Um, and I just don't think life works that way. Maybe that's just me. But I want students to trust me because I want them to see that I'm going to be giving them the most accurate information. And I'm going to be willing to say, you know what? I'm not sure. Let's look that up. And we'll either look it up together right there on the spot, or I'll call somebody that I know that has the best answer, or I'll say, I'll get back to you because I'm going to need to check on that. And I actually get back to them. And it's those little things like that, that lead the student to go, okay, Dr. West really does seem to have my best interest in mind. And she does what she says. And that way, when I am guiding them, they do have this sense of trust because that sense of trust is really important. I mean, you are talking about classes, but you're also talking about someone's future and someone's career. And so building that trust within that relationship is very important. So here's what I basically do if I'm going to advise somebody online that's the same that I would do if I was talking to them face to face. The first thing is I still use an online sign up system, even when they're going to come to my office. Um, there are a whole bunch of examples out there. You could use something like Calendly or Sign Up Genius. A lot of these are free. Sometimes even your particular software at your university will have a kind of like a sign up feature where you can send out a link and students can pick times. I think this is really important, one, because it allows you to coordinate it with your schedule, but two, um, you know, students can kind of pick around whatever they're doing around their classes or around their job or whatever it is that they're doing. And I just like to use online signups. I think it's a really easy way to keep up with things. The other thing that I do is I take paper notes and I send a copy to students via email. Now, at my former university, when I had 1600 students, no, I didn't kill that many trees. But what was really nice is that the advising software that we had allowed me to build a custom form in the software. So I wasn't taking it on paper, but I was using the same exact form. And that's the image that you see here on the other side of the screen. It's just an example of the, the form that I've been using for years and years and years. I have the date, I have the student's name, I put their ID number because the universities that I've worked at, you needed the ID number to look up their, you know, their registration information. I put a series of check boxes there of things that I do typically often so that I didn't have to write them over and over again. So things like remove their hold. I did a gen ed check. I did a graduation check. We talked about career advice. We talked about choosing a major or minor, just so that I didn't have to physically hand write those notes. So you could customize those things on your form so that you could quickly check those. I also put whether they were a major or a minor over there. And I use that in different ways. Sometimes I'll write in whatever their major or their minor is, or I'll circle whether they are a psychology major or minor. Um, I've used those in a number of different ways, but it's just easy to take notes. And then I just have a big box where I just write stuff. I write down the classes that they're thinking about taking. I write down any other notes about a conversation that we've had. So if they're thinking about studying abroad, I will write that down. If there's any sort of follow-up that I wanted to do with the student, I will write that down there like send them information after you talk to the registrar about X, Y, and Z, so that I don't forget to send them the information that I got from the registrar. And then I will send students a copy of this, again, either through the advising software at my previous institution, or again, just on paper right now. I literally take a picture of it with my cell phone or my scanner, and I email it to the student so that everyone has a copy of the notes that I took. And I always cover these three topics, and sometimes other things come up, but I'm definitely going to hit these three topics in this order in my meetings. The first thing is just, how are you? What's going on? What do you need this semester? Is the semester going okay? Do you need anything outside of class? You know, is there any other resource that I can connect you with? And we just do a general check-in. Um, that's always important, but it has been extra important this semester as students have had to rapidly transition online, they've had to relocate themselves, they have all this scary pandemic stuff happening in and around their life. So that's been a really important question this semester. But sometimes what's really nice about that, especially if students know that you're going to ask that regularly, they'll start being more honest with you. They'll start saying, yeah, 
my math class isn't going so well. And then that gives you a really good opportunity to talk about study strategy or tutoring or whatever options might be available to them. After we've sort of done a quick check-in, I don't go straight to classes. I do my check-in about their career goals. I'm like, what are you thinking? Last time you told me you wanted to be an occupational therapist. Are you still thinking that? Have you done any of the volunteering that I suggested that you do? Did you try this? Did you try that? And sometimes students will say, yeah. Sometimes they'll say no. Sometimes I'll go, yeah, I tried it, but now I'm not so sure. And again, I just do that career goal check-in. And then once we've established whatever the goal is, whether it's the same or whether it's different, then we go into number three, which is, okay, if this is your goal, let's talk about what classes you need to take in the fall, or let's talk about what you might want to do this summer. Um, have you thought about an internship? If not, let's go visit the career center. So it's not just classes, it's also activities, but it's all the stuff that's going to get them to that goal that's in number two. So that's what's really important is kind of following this structure. And again, if other stuff comes up, it comes up. But I like to sort of go in this order. I like students to see that, again, the classes is not the most important thing. Their health is first. Their needs are first. Their goal is second. And then how to get there is third. Because I want them to see that that's what advising is really about. And that's what their classes should be about, is how to get to that goal. All of that builds a rapport with students. They get used to this routine, even though I don't like directly tell them that this is my three questions, although I, I can, they get used to my style. It's like they come in knowing that these are the three things that I'm gonna ask them. And I do this in person and I do this online. Um, so that being said, let me kind of switch over and talk about there are a few things that I do a little bit differently if it's online versus in person. The first thing that I do is something more like this for our meeting. Now, this is um, any meeting as a software tool, but I use Zoom. There are tons of other um, meeting softwares. The reason I personally prefer Zoom is because one, it's free, and two, there is a very easy way to screen share on Zoom. And so the student can screen share and you can screen share. So the student can make like a Word document or they can show you something from their course management system on the screen. And then you can do the same thing. I like to bring up whatever their transcript is, or if, for example, they have something like degree works that your school uses, and we can actually look at it together and I can point to things with the mouse and I can say, okay, what are you thinking about to fill in this slot here? What are you thinking about to fill in this slot? here. So I like to use Zoom meetings. One, we can actually see each other with the camera feature. And two, we can do a screen share. Again, there are other softwares for that, but those are the two features that are important. Being able to see and hear each other and being able to share a screen. What I do differently if I'm going to meet with them online versus in person is I'm going to send them the link for the whatever the software, in this case, Zoom, just so they have it the night before and they can get downloaded or whatever it is they might need to do to get set for the meeting. The other thing that I'm going to do is send them a standard email the night before. And again, I say standard because I send it to every single student. That way I don't have to rewrite it each time. I just copy and paste it and I put in the new meeting link. Um, but what's standard about it is that I have in there, you know, please come prepared with this. Please come prepared with this. And this is what we're going to talk about. And then again, as I've already mentioned, I use any sort of screen sharing software, again, like Zoom, so that I can show them their progress and we can actually talk through it step by step. And I can say, look, I, I see this interim grade here or I see this midterm grade here. What have we been trying since then? Or, oh my gosh, kudos, you got an A in your interim grade. That's amazing. So you can kind of go back and forth. That's really all I do differently. Um, I still try to build that rapport. I still ask those same three questions. We still go through that whole process. Again, not even just because of the time of this pandemic. When I was teaching with 1,600 students, we had to do some of this just for volume's sake and because there were students that would attend UNC Charlotte that weren't necessarily living on campus or in Charlotte. They could have been anywhere in the world, but particularly anywhere in the state and taking classes with us. And so sometimes it just wasn't feasible for them to come to campus. So I have been using this kind of Zoom meeting setup for quite a while now. But again, the whole point isn't so much whether they're sitting across from you or staring at you on a webcam. It's more what you do while they're sitting across from you or staring at you in a webcam. At least to me, that's more important. 
Um, before we go to questions and answers, because I see a lot of you are sending some really great questions in, which is awesome. I wanted to give you just a few other resources that I think are very helpful. The first one is Nakata. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I don't completely remember what Nakata stands for. I think it's National Academic, that's the AC, Advising, that's the AD Association. I think that's what it stands for. I honestly have just called it Nakata for so many years now, I forgot what it stands for. But I've given you one link there on the screen. You can also just Google Nakata and it will come up. This is an organization specifically for academic advisors. Um, there are parts of the website that you can't access unless you have joined, but the link that I've given you there, you can see even if you have not joined and are not an official member, and they have tons of resources, things about how to handle particular situations with students, um, things for best practices, all kinds of information. So Nakata is a really great website and a really great resource. Um, they also have meetings and things. If you are actually interested in joining them, you can get a lot of helpful information that way. And then the second two things are just see if your school has some sort of advising philosophy and or expectations for students and faculty during the meeting. Um, I think it's really helpful to send students that. I, again, I send every single one of my advisees my advising philosophy. I want them to know what I'm going to do and what I am expecting and what I hope they understand about advising. And so if you've never taken the time to develop your own or you don't want to develop your own, see if your department or your college or your university already has one. Most of the time there already is one buried somewhere deep within the registrar's material or something like that. So go and see if your school has one that you could use or you could adopt or you could alter just slightly to fit your style. And then the last thing is to just check out what your school offers for advising software and communication. See if they have a way to do an online checklist and an online sheet like I used to do or see if you need to do some sort of paper sheet. See if they have some sort of software that's already available like Zoom or something like that. So don't necessarily reinvent the wheel if your school already has things. So I realized that I sort of rushed through that a little bit, but I really wanted to save as much time as possible for questions that you have about either things that I do in an advising session in general or things that I do with my students online. So with that, I, I'll kind of open it up to questions and we'll go from there. Awesome, yes. Well, that was amazing, Kat. And we started to get a few questions that um, were populating through people sending them in individually, but definitely if there are any other questions, still feel free to submit them either individually through the question submission section or uh, through the group chat and we will we will tackle them. But the very first question is, um, has students needed more advisement since the transition for you or has it actually decreased? That's a great question. It depends on the student. What I have found is that my good students need a different kind of advising. Um, they are more concerned about I can't do an internship now because the world is shut down. And so you kind of have to talk them off the ledge and say, you know, it's okay. We're, we're going to be able to make that up. There are other opportunities, things like that. I've also found that there are some students that just kind of drop off the radar. And so I've had to reach out to them more intensely than I would have had to before. But for the most part, I would say the majority of my students, it's been about the same. It's just been a little bit more of an interesting introduction as opposed to anything else. So it's kind of started with, this has been a crazy semester, right? And admitting to them that I've also thought this is an insane semester, that it's not just them that thinks it's insane. So that's really been the biggest change. And then once we kind of half-heartedly laugh about the fact that it's been crazy, we jump into the advising basically the same way we would before. Um, Again, you might get one or two students that need something slightly different, but for the most part, because I had that established pattern, my students are still ready for that pattern and they almost probably find comfort in that pattern. So that's a really good question. Yeah, I, what I've started to notice from just talking with other faculty is that the admission and just the acknowledgement from their professor that, yeah, this is weird. The, like yeah. I don't feel great about this either. Really does yeah. just like that, that that leveling off of we're all in this together helps yeah. them so much and just like recognize that no, I don't expect you to be normal right now because it's not normal. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, second question from Peter is uh, how do you draw a line between personal versus academic advising right now, and especially when there are more personal issues that are surfacing? This is also a brilliant question. 
Um, before I answer it, I'm going to refer you, Peter, to the Nakata website. They have tons of articles exactly on this, not even because of the pandemic, just in general, because that is something that will come up a lot. Um, it probably comes up even more when you're a psychology professor because students hear psychology and they think you're a therapist. And I am definitely not a therapist. I was not trained as a therapist. Um, so I do remind students of that. If they are bringing up personal issues, I do try to sort of stop them and say, look, I am happy to discuss this with you, but you need to keep in mind that I am not a confidential source. So that if I hear something in here that needs to be reported, I'm gonna have to report it. If you want a confidential source, here is, and I just keep them printed, here is the counseling center's website and they can keep things confidential um, because they they have different rules that they function under. So I always just kind of try to stop them. You know, a little bit is okay, especially if they're just kind of telling you they're stressed, like Dr. West, this is crazy and I didn't get my homework done and I don't know what I'm doing. That, that part is usually okay because sometimes they just need to vent. But you can tell when it's starting to get beyond venting and they're telling you something that's a little too personal. Sometimes they'll say something before I even have a chance to stop them. In that case, I say, look, that's a big thing that you're dealing with. And we have resources on campus. Is it okay if I submit a care report for you? And every university has something that's like that. So you'll need to find what your university calls a care report. And basically you can say, I was having an advising meeting with the student. They told me this you guys need to follow up. And then the appropriate office on campus follows up. And most students, when you say that, will go, that would be really nice, thank, thank you. Yeah, that would be great if you could help me get some resources. So that's sort of where I draw the line is, are they venting or are they telling me something that they're gonna need an additional resource for? And if they need an additional resource, that's when I try to stop them, warn them, give them the counseling center website and or say, can I submit this and get you some resources? That's how I try to draw the line. Yeah, that's an incredibly tough one, especially right now. Um, oh my God, so tough. Uh, from Rita, how are you finding or creating moments of joy for students during this remote time? That's actually a really good question too. So. One of the things that we have been doing, or I've tried to do, and this is not really so much with my advising as much as with my classes, but I send weekly check-ins. Now, again, I'm I'm a little bit biased because I'm a Packback user. So when I, um, I have students, sometimes I will check in with our learning management system, just send them an email, hey, are you okay? Unrelated to class, just are you okay? But also what I like to do on Packback is just, I've been just throwing some questions in there that are related to stuff whatever we're talking about. So like, for example, in my intro class, we're doing social psychology. And so I'm just like, what's the weirdest social thing you've seen people do recently? Um, or, or, you know, I just try to like talk about fun stuff that they're doing in class. In development, we talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs as one of the sort of influences on development. And I, I gave him an extra credit opportunity. And I said, you know, how has this whole pandemic um, altered where people sort of fall on the Maslow's pyramid of needs. Um, we've also, I've also encouraged them to do, again, as extra credit, a self-care activity. And I sent them a whole list of free self-care things that they can do. Um, I also just try to pay attention to what they're writing. So for example, one student said that they loved art and I just wrote back, that's awesome. What kind of art do you do? And that led to this whole like conversation about the fact that they do art. So it's sort of more of just paying attention differently than I did before um, and encouraging my students to, to talk about what's happening, but not necessarily like the news talks about it. Like we talk about it from a more like scientific perspective because that's my discipline. And I think that really helps reduce the stress at the same time, giving them a sense of kind of control over it. But yeah, that's been that's been a bit of a challenge not getting to see them. We're gonna have a, a Zoom check-in meeting on Thursday. That's another option for you is just to say, hey, anybody that wants to log on, we're gonna log on together and just do a review session. So that's another thing you could try. But yeah, just being creative. Yeah, I would definitely recommend if anyone has a dog, bring that to your next class. Uh, a big win. <laughs> And then uh, the final question from Jennifer is um, kind of a, a branch off the same tree is, are your students staying connected to each other right now? And how are they doing it? Is it helping? 
not as much as I think they would like, definitely not as much as I would like. Um, again, shout out to Packback. They are forced to have weekly discussions anyway, pandemic or not. So that is one way they are staying connected. Um, again, I am doing these Zoom meetings. Um, I don't do lectures via Zoom. I found it's easier to do a recorded lecture and I asked them to watch those first, but these kind of weekly Zoom check-ins are, are sort of review sessions, sort of complaining sessions, sort of just, hey, chit-chat sessions. And I think the students really, really like those. Um, unfortunately, that's about all that I'm able to help them do to connect. I know that some of them um, are, are using other tools that they have, group texts and all kinds of various apps that they have to stay connected with each other. But in general, it's just been a lot of digital communication um, and a lot of just admitting to each other that everyone finds this weird and everyone finds this hard. And I think that's how it's helping is that it doesn't necessarily make it easier for them, but it validates their feeling of this is hard. Absolutely. Well, and that was uh, the last question. So unless anyone else has another question uh, for Dr. Kat West, we will let her go back to her busy day. But uh, thank you all so much for just your presence today, uh, the, the focus that you all have on prioritizing your students' needs, and also for Kat for sharing all of her expertise and experience in this, uh, in this very specific and chaotic time. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Yes, everyone stay safe and uh, we look forward to talking with you hopefully again soon.